We're ready? All right. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming to the Contra Costa County District Attorney Candidates Forum. My name is James Wu. I'm the president of the Contra Costa County Bar Association. The Bar Association is a voluntary member nonprofit comprised of over 1,700 attorneys who work or live in Contra Costa County. The Bar Associ Association is very pleased to co-sponsor this event with the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley. Before I introduce our moderator, I would like to thank the many volunteers both here in the auditorium and also behind the scenes who put, it, put in a huge amount of work to make this event happen. Here in the auditorium, we have several law student volunteers, some of you have already met, raise your hands, who are going around the auditorium with index cards so that you can write down questions if you have any and present them, uh, and they will be screened and presented to the moderator. We'd also like to thank the volunteers from the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley who are serving as our timers for this evening, and they're down here in the front row. Thank you very much. Thank you to the city of Walnut Creek, and um, who is also videotaping this event. So if you know folks who aren't here tonight, they can watch the event on CCTV. The dates will be announced at a later time. Also, I'd like to thank past Bar Association President Dick Frankel for reviewing and sorting the questions. Thank you, Dick. And to Bar Association Board Member Dorian Peters and Executive Director Teresa Hurley, who helped to coordinate this event along with Ann Flynn from the League of Women Voters. And of course, thank you to our moderator, Gail Murray, who I will be introducing now. Gail Murray is a longtime member of the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley, a nonpartisan organization. Her participation in tonight's forum is part of the League's mission to encourage informed and active participation in government. Gail is a former mayor and council member of Walnut Creek, a former member of the board of directors of BART, and a former chair of the Capital Corridor Joint Powers Agency. She is currently president of Gail Murray Consulting, and she focuses on transportation policy and planning. She is also a research assistant of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. During her career, Gail served as the Acting Assistant General Manager at AC Transit District and the Acting Director of Transportation for the University of California at Berkeley. Gail received her Bachelor of Arts from San Jose State University and her Master's in Public Administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Please welcome Gail Murray, our moderator. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for all of you joining us tonight here. Um, as Mr. Wu said, the League of Women Voters is a co-sponsor of this event, and we do that as part of our mission to educate and inform voters. We're nonpartisan. We don't support any parties or any candidates. Uh, we just simply want to make sure that voters are educated. Um, and we also thank the city of Walnut Creek for agreeing to film this so that other people who couldn't be here tonight, tonight can see this. Um, just now, each candidate has pulled a number, and so they will begin the numbers, they will begin their opening statements according to that pulling of the numbers, one, two, and three. And then when we do the closing statements at the end, it will be in the reverse order. And as uh, you learned, you can put in your cards and um, Dick is sorting through them, so we don't have a lot of the same ones. But I have a whole stack here, and I have a whole stack of questions that the Bar Association and some that the League have already prepared. So we're not going to run out of questions, and, but we welcome your questions. Um, the question has to be for all the candidates to answer. So don't direct it at just a single candidate, because those will be screened out. Um, each candidate will have a minute and a half to answer the question. And we have league members out in front who have um, placards that they're going to hold up when there is 15 seconds left and then when that time is up and they have to be quiet and move on to the next one. Uh, we don't allow any personal attacks. 
However, if there's something in the public record that the um, candidate wants to say about another candidate, that's permitted, but no personal attacks. Um, and so uh, uh, the other thing I want to say, and I don't know whether you got this information, but you are allowed two rebuttals during the forum. So if they want to rebut somebody, something somebody has said, they, have, they can use one of their two rebuttals. And those are 60 seconds each. Um, this forum, as I mentioned, is being televised. So if you haven't done it, turn off your cell phone, because we don't want all that ringing in the background. And I also saw a, a lot of people clapping uh, before we started. But don't clap, don't applaud, don't cheer, don't heckle, don't do anything like that. Just listen uh, during the question and answer part of the, the period. So now we'll pro proceed with one and a half minute opening statements, beginning with Lawrence Strauss, who has pulled number one. Thank you. Mr. Smith was arrested in Contra Costa County for drunk driving. He was given a citation to appear in court about 90 days, and he went to the courthouse for a citation. But was the complaint filed? No, their office didn't file the complaint. So Mr. Smith was told to contact the district attorney's office to see whether or not they're going to press charges or wait until a notice is mailed to his place that was on the ticket. Unfor unfortunately, uh, Mr. Smith had to move, so there was a complaint filed about 11 months later, and the notice was mailed to Mr. Smith. A bench warrant was issued for his appearance because he didn't know about the court date. When he finally realized there was a court date, 18 months later, he went to the clerk's office to put himself on calendar. Now, what do you think Mr. Smith, who was arrested for drunk driving, was doing in those 18 months? He was driving drunk. I'm running because I believe that the district attorney's office is not doing enough for the safety of the public and are putting the community at risk. And this occurs all the time, not just in drunk driving cases, but in battery cases, under the influence of controlled substance cases, and the thefts that are ravaging our neighborhood. As a small business owner for 25 years, I know how to operate a law practice successfully, efficiently, and economically. And there's a lot of waste in that office that needs to be taken out in order for the district attorney job to be more effective. Thank you for your attention. And Mr. Strauss uh, did use this microphone, but I want to tell all the candidates, sir, this little thing in front of you is a microphone, too. So you can use that if you prefer. Uh, number two is Paul Graves. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I graduated law school in 1995, and I began my career here as a prosecutor. I fell in love with the county, and my wife and I decided that this is where we wanted to raise our family. And I've been serving your community for 22 years now as a prosecutor. And a large part of that has been prosecuting gang crimes, sexual assault crimes, homicides, and serious and violent felonies. I earned the privilege of supervising the homicide unit, and after several years, I was promoted to my current position, which is Senior Deputy District Attorney in charge of the Family Violence Unit, which is sexual assault, domestic violence, and elder abuse, our most vulnerable victims. Over my career, I have earned the trust of everyone who has come to know me, including the East Bay Times that pointed out I'm the only candidate with meaningful experience as a prosecutor, and that I have the necessary tools to make the reform needed in the office. I'm grateful to have the trust of all law enforcement agencies in Contra Costa County, the firefighters, the District Attorney's Association, Child Victim Advocate Mark Klass, and even defense attorneys who know, who all know, that I will always be motivated to do the right thing, I'm their partner in justice, and that I will keep their community safe. These endorsements from individuals who have known me for 22 years mean a lot to me because it means they've seen me on the job and they know that I can keep the community safe, make the needed reforms, and better serve our victims. Thank you. And our third speaker is Diana Becton. Good evening, everyone, and thanks to our organizers and volunteers for this uh, event tonight and an opportunity to speak to all of you. I am proud to serve as your district attorney. My commitment to service to the community is very deep rooted and goes back to when I was a little girl. I grew up in East Oakland and there was a time when a new pastor came to our church. He looked around, he saw the, des the desolate folks in the community. 
He saw the men on the corner who had no jobs and were drinking, the women who were being trafficked, and the children on the corner who were rolling dice instead of going to school. And when he came back the next day, he said to all of us, we're going to get out of these lazy rocking chairs and get out into our communities and make a difference. That's where I come from, and I've been trying to make that difference ever since. It has been really quite my honor to be able to work to keep our community safe and to give voice to victims of crime in our community. But there is so much more to being a prosecutor in the 21st century. And so in addition to keeping our community safe, I'm working hard for, for our youth, for the mentally ill in our community, as well as better outcomes for those who are accused of low-level and nonviolent crimes. I welcome the opportunity to speak with you tonight, and I hope that I earn your vote. Okay, now we've had the opening statements, and so for the next hour or so, I'm going to ask them questions. Um, I'm going to rotate among the candidates so nobody has a disproportionate advantage, one or the other. Um, and they're allowed um, 90 minutes, uh, 90 seconds. Nine minutes. 90 minutes, right. <laughs> You get to take over the whole thing. 90 seconds per question. So, starting with the first question, uh, and this goes to uh, Paul Graves, since you spoke up. <laughs> um, would your district attorney's office cooperate with federal immigration officials in immigration enforcement efforts? Does your answer change if the person to be detained or deported was convicted of a serious offense, such as domestic violence or a sex crime? Well, in terms of cooperating with uh, immigration officials, the district attorney's job is relatively limited. When we come in contact with people, we're coming in contact with people who are victims and witnesses to crimes. And I can assure you, we need to create an environment in our community where they feel comfortable and satisfied coming forward. And I deal with them every day in my current assignment. And what I can guarantee you is when they come forward as a victim or a witness, we will protect them and we will help them get their visas and apply for their visas. We are not going to be calling ICE and have them deported. We have an interest as a community to make sure people from our entire community, even undocumented individuals, feel comfortable coming forward because that is essential to public safety and it's something that we need to do to protect all of our victims and witnesses and members of the community. Okay, and the second person, um, Diana Becton. Thank you. So first of all, as a leader in the criminal justice system, in September of last year, recognizing this as an issue, I convened a caucus in Sacramento that included our chief justice, our legislature, as well as uh, those in, from district attorney's offices, from public defender's office, and from the community. Because we needed to talk about how we, in these institutions, can make sure that victims of crime f feel safe to come forward and be supportive, and that they know that our offices will be supportive of them. It's a public safety issue when we have members of our community who are afraid to come forward and report a crime solely because of their status in the immigrant community. And so we want to make sure that we're taking care of victims of crime, and that includes all of those from the immigrant community. In addition to that public forum, I also stand firmly with 60 other uh, leaders in the criminal justice system from around the country to stand firmly for those uh, who are affected by DACA. I have lent my voice to those prosecutors around the country who have signed on to those cases pending in our federal district court to keep the DACA in place so that we can protect our dreamers. Okay, and finally, Mr. Strauss. Well, Governor Brown signed the legislation making California a sanctuary state, which prohibits cooperation with the immigration authorities. As district attorney, I would abide by that legislation that he signed. There is a visa process where victims of crime who can come forward to report their crimes and go through the immigration proceedings and apply for a visa. In addition, as our office, as district attorney office, I would help the victims of crime and direct them to the right resources so they could get those visas. It's very important that we don't chill 
uh, reporting of crime in our communities. Can you imagine if someone was an immigrant and a horrible crime occurred, a child abuse or, or a rape, a murder, and they're afraid to come forward because of their immigration consequences? So I would not cooperate with ICE in terms of immigration. Uh, I think it's a, a crucial issue in order to encourage people to come forward with the immigrant communities. In addition, I would like to reach out to the immigrant, immigrant communities and meet with them at their local churches and tell them, hey, if there's a crime happening, don't be afraid to report it. Our office is not going to send you to INS. We're going to try to protect you as much as possible. Thank you. OK. The next question, we'll start with uh, Diana Becton. And this is kind of a follow-on. You sort of talked about this, but the audience had a question about victim rights, what it means to you. And I'm going to combine it with another audience question. Are victim rights and social justice at odds? Please explain. Okay, I couldn't hear the very last okay. part. Our victim, Our victim rights and social justice at odds. Okay, thank you. Well, the first part of your question has to do with victim rights. And I stand firmly, firmly to support victims of crime in our community. First of all, we have our attorneys who fight hard every day to bring voice to the victims of crime and to bring justice to the victims of crime and to hold those who hurt them accountable. Secondly, we will continue to provide the resources in our office so that our victim, victim advocates can be there to support our victims of crime throughout the process, helping them not only through the court process but with so many other aspects of uh, their lives that are affected by crime. And then thirdly, we want to make sure that we are continuing uh, that support even when the cases are over. You asked the question as to whether or not victims' rights and, public and social justice are at odds. And I think not, because I think the social justice reform that I'm talking about is actually the kind of reform that keeps our communities safer, keeps people away from committing crimes so that they are not harming victims in our community. And we do that by making sure, for example, that our youth are um, moving away from the criminal justice system and that we're providing other alternatives for them. And that people who have served their time uh, once they come home, that we've given them a second chance to get housing and jobs so that they don't have to go back into criminal activity. Okay, same question, Mr. Strauss. Well, I don't think you're at odds. Um, what I believe is what's called restorative justice, and that's when the victim has the right to speak to the defendant. Last week at a parole hearing, I was sitting at the client's brother who was murdered had a chance to go through this process of meeting the killer in prison. And it was a very healing process, a very peaceful process. He actually came to support my client's parole into the community, understanding his background. So I don't think that social justice and victims' rights is at odd. Um, I think we need to stop putting people in jails and prisons and overcrowding them. I don't think every case should be sent there, especially with the mentally ill and people who have drug problems. Um, I'm handling a case right now in Contra Costa County with a mentally ill client who's sitting there at the Martinez Detention Facility, and I'm trying to get him out of jail because it's doing no good. He doesn't understand what's going on. So uh, I think social, social justice and victim rights do go hand in hand. And as district attorney, I would like to try to establish a restorative justice program in this county so victims could heal as well as uh, gaining closure from their crimes. Thank you. Mr. Grace. Thank you. I think at times, victims' rights and social justice can be at odds, I'll be honest with you. Um, that's not to say that they're not both noble goals, but it is a very difficult process when you're dealing with victims. And I've been doing it for 22 years, talking to victims. And when you have to explain to a victim of a rape or a child molest or a sexual assault that there's some greater good and that somehow their crime that was committed to them uh, is worthy of social justice reform or that the suspect should not get the punishment that the legislator has indicated for that crime, it is a very difficult process to explain to victims. It does not mean that we don't look for social justice reform. We don't look for ways to prevent justice. But when a crime happens to a victim of our community, it is our obligation to seek justice for that victim. And I see it day in and day out. 
Our priority should be public safety and the safety of the victims and the voters of the state of California in 2008 enacted the Victims' Bill of Rights. It's Section 1, Article 28 of the, United, of the California Constitution. And it sets forth a bunch of rights for victims for that very purpose because victims were not being treated fairly in the system. And so whenever we're talking about any sort of reform, I'm open to any sort of reform. But we need to start with how does it impact public safety and how does it affect the rights of the victims? Because let's remember, people who are victimized did not choose to be victims. Thank you. I'd like to rebut, please. Okay, your first it, rebuttal, 60 seconds. Thank you. In my process of representing inmates at life or parole hearings, the first words out of a victim's mouth is why. And how come you haven't apologized? They'll come up 20 years, we've never received an apology. I don't believe Mr. Gray's position is correct. I think that through restorative justice principles and also through the demonstration of remorse by an individual, and I'm talking about sincere remorse, not just an apology, but someone who's working on bettering themselves, so it never, never occurs again. I do think that social justice and victims' rights are completely compatible, and in long term, public safety would be better in its course. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next question, and since you're on a roll, Mr. Strauss, we'll start with you. Um, Gun violence is a big problem, especially in parts of West and East County. What would you do as district attorney to help solve the gun violence problems in our county? Well, there are several enhancements for the use of a gun in crimes, but I think we need to actually have an outreach pro program into the communities in order to educate people about the use of gun violence. Now, I want to establish a program in Contra Costa County where I could get someone who's actually been paroled, a violent gang member, to go into the schools at eighth grade and talk to the children and say, look, you don't want to get involved with guns or crimes. I spent 30 years in a prison for this. And I can tell you, that's not what I want. That's not what you want to do. So I think the way to solve the gun issues is to actually go into the communities, have programs, bring people who've been on parole from <coughs> serving licenses, bring victims of crime to speak to the community and talk about this devastation of gun violence. And we have to educate our children, not just at eighth grade, but continue on through ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th, 12th, and even junior college. I think these programs should exist. Um, and then Mr. Graves. First and foremost, uh, to eliminate gun violence, the prosecutor's office needs to make sure we're aggressively prosecuting those who illegally possess firearms and use firearms in the commission of crimes. Um, that is one way, but it's not the only way. There's other things as a DA you can do to lead, which is proactive solutions to stopping gun violence before it occurs, projects like ceasefire, projects like using our task force to intercept illegal firearms and transportation of firearms in our county to keep them out of the wrong hands. Absolutely is something we should be doing uh, aggressively and every day we uh, are on the job. Gun buyback programs are also very important and helpful because some people have guns laying around their house that they may not use, they may be protected, but they can be bought, gotten off the street so that they don't fall into the wrong hands. In addition, gun safety for parents and children uh, is an important aspect and having gun locks and gun lock distributions is something that we should do and parents need to be aware and adults need to be aware that it will not be tolerated in our community if you give a gun to a minor. And I can tell you from personal experience, I tried one of the only cases in this county, People versus Aguilar, where an adult gave a gun to a minor, and that minor tragically used that gun to commit suicide. And when I saw that, we prosecuted that case, and we went to trial, and it was in front of a court trial, and we got a sentence. But that's the kind of message we need to send to the adults in our community. They will not be tolerated here to hand guns to minors, because there's bad consequences no matter what. Thank you. And respected. Thank you. You know, as a judge, I have had the opportunity, unfortunately, to hear the cries of a mother whose son actually died in her arms on her doorsteps, the victim of gun violence. And so it's really a very serious problem for us to tackle. And I want to talk about some of the things that my office is already doing uh, with respect to gun violence. The first has to do with programs like Ceasefire, where we partner with our faith community, with other community leaders, with probation and other law enforcement agencies to go out into the communities. And I've gone on those walks myself. One, to bring a message that uh, in our communities, 
uh, we do not tolerate gun violence. And those who perpetrate that violence, and we often know who the shooters are, that they will be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. On the other side of things, I want to talk about the work that we're doing with our, um, with our youth, though. We have a prosecutor in our office who goes out to the schools to talk about gun violence and gun <coughs> safety and to talk about the gang violence, which often comes along with the guns. We also have a prosecutor who is working with the Brady campaign. The Brady campaign brings the message to parents who want to be responsible gun owners and how they can responsibly, even though they have children in their household, uh, own guns and keep them safe. We have the task force as well that does uh, target those who are the most violent and those who are using guns in our community. Okay, great. Um, this is a question from the audience. And I'll start with uh, Mr. Grace. What are your thoughts concerning the disproportionate number of African American uh, male convictions in Contra Costa County? And I guess I would add to that, what efforts would you make to change that situation? Well, our office needs to be very clear that we only prosecute cases that we can ethically file, cases that we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And we get cases brought to our office, we review them, and we file them. Uh, statistically, uh, I'm not familiar with what statistic that card is actually referring to and which study, but it's something that we need to be aware of and cognizant of. Um, implicit bias and disparate treatment are real, and they're things that we need to address head on. And we need to have trainings in our office regarding things like implicit bias. But if we are filing cases correctly and honestly and ethically, we're only prosecuting people who have committed crimes that we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's the way it should be. And in a situation where we have a prosecutor that finds that they cannot ethically prosecute the case, that case should be dismissed. And I've been in that position before against a young man of color when I went against my supervisor as a young attorney and said, I don't believe I can prove this case. And I had a piece of evidence that nobody had seen, and I had my supervisor listen to it at risk of my career and getting hired permanent. And I took a stand, and when my supervisor listened to that tape, he came back and he agreed with me. And he said, let's go ahead and get him in for a lie detector test. We did, and he was freed that day. And I stand by that, and I stand behind that in every case. And that's the way I expect my prosecutors to be in my office. And when you do that, you restore the trust of the community. And the community should know that the people we are prosecuting are only those who have committed the crimes um, that we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And we will take the time to do the implicit bias training and continue that training. Ms. Becton. Thank you. Well, you mentioned statistics, and we know that nationwide our statistics tell us that the criminal justice system has had a disparate impact on communities of color. And so we do have to be mindful of the way that we um, prosecute cases and the way that uh, we handle cases in our office. One of the things that I think is very important for us to do is to continue the work that I'm starting with our committee that is examining every aspect of our office. It's exa examining all of the work that we're doing to make sure that our processes and our procedures are free of bias. Another thing that we are doing is we're working currently with the Racial Justice Task Force that was established by the Board of Supervisors in Contra Costa County to look at whether or not there's disparate treatment in our communities. And then also, I'm working and also to bring in uh, those evaluators and also working with um, academics who will help us to evaluate the information that we receive so that we can look specifically at the impact that we're having uh, with respect to prosecutions in our county. It's important for us to have that data so, because sometimes we are having a disparate impact and we don't even know it. So we are working to get the data as well. Uh, and then we can, once we have that data, we'll be able to address the issues that are raised, which is also why we're working with academics so that they can help us to evaluate the data that we receive. And Mr. Strauss. You know, I was a juvenile prosecutor in Hawaii, and I experienced with some troubled youth. Having also been an appointed attorney for the Board of Parole Hearings, doing life of parole hearings, and looking at a lot of reports, and seeing where exactly our resources need to be sent, I've noticed that it's in the juvenile stage. And what this county is doing is we are taking juveniles, charging them with misdemeanors, and throwing them in juvenile hall, <coughs> children for jails. And unfortunately, 
There's a lot of African American, a lot of Latino clients. I'm also with the conflict panel, which is like the public defender's office, so I handle those cases as well. What we really need to be doing is focusing our efforts on the young people to try to help them. A single mother whose child is taken away from her and placed in juvenile hall for a misdemeanor, that's not helping her. We have to make sure that that mother has resources. That child is much better being taken out of juvenile hall, placed in the home with the parent he knows and loves, and disciplined appropriately, and then come back to court. So yes, unfortunately, there is a disproportionate number of people of color and Latino clients. I see it every month when I'm down there at the prison system, and we need to do something about it. Thank you. OK, the next question, I'm going to start with Ms. Becton. Because of the rapid rise in home and rent prices, rising homelessness has become a critical issue in the Bay Area. As district attorney, how would you deal with the quality of life issues that result, such as illegal encampments, trespassing, and municipal code violations? Okay. Thank you. So uh, it's, it's actually been about a week and a half now since I initiated conversations uh, with our city managers and also with law enforcement chiefs to discuss the issue of homelessness in our communities. We started the first task force to work with uh, law enforcement and city managers in Central County. We're also putting together another task force in East County and in West County. We're looking at all of the problems that are created uh, by all of the encampments that you just referenced in each of our communities and also searching for ways to come up with better outcomes. This issue ties also into the work that I'm doing with our mental health communities because we know that the um, communities are very much aligned. There are problems that uh, we face, mental health, homelessness, and drug addiction, and that they're all intertwined. It's one of the reasons that I'm putting together these task force so that we can work together with all of our criminal justice partners and bring a holistic approach to these issues. We're learning that we cannot continue to work in vacuums to solve these problems, that all of us have to work together. And so we'll be looking for ways uh, to address these issues in our community and looking for ways to safely divert the homeless as well as the mentally ill away from our criminal justice system, holding them accountable, but at the same time uh, working for safe neighborhoods. Mr. Strauss. You know, homelessness is a problem. Do you know that's illegal to sleep in your car in Concord, in the city of Concord? I had a client of mine who was homeless and he was arrested. They did a search in the car, unfortunately there was drugs there. But he was harassed because he can't sleep in your car in Concord on the city streets. What we need to do is find safe areas for the homelessness, maybe church parking lots or someone to volunteer their property where they could stay overnight and get a night's sleep. We need to have not only police officers, but social workers on the street to go and deal with the homeless situation, to see and make sure that they're getting the services they need. Now, as a business owner, I don't think we should have homeless people sleeping on the streets of Walnut Creek. Um, we, can't, we can't do that. It's uh, unfair to the businesses, their customers. So we need to find a solution. And what my solution would be is to designate areas, safe areas, for the homelessness and to make sure that when there is police contact with them, that there's also a referral to a social worker or have the social worker ride along with the police officers who are in contact with our homeless community. And Mr. Graves. This is an issue where a district attorney needs to lead. Uh, it is true that a vast majority of our homeless population suffer from mental health issues. And I've been talking about this now for over a year. Our criminal justice system is not equipped to handle the mentally ill. And we need to change. Um, we need to increase our diversion for mentally ill defendants. We need to actually address them earlier in the process before a serious or violent crime occurs. We have a mental health court, but oftentimes it is easier for a defendant to plead to credit time served and go back out on the street and not receive any mental health treatment with nowhere to go. I've been advocating for a group to get together and model a mental health justice center after our family justice center. A place where people who are homeless, have drug addictions, or mental illness 
can go and have a one-stop shop where there is psychological therapy there, where there's drug therapy there, where we can actually work on getting them housing, where we can talk to them about issues that they have and provide the service. We can't just keep moving them around. We can't just put them in a place and say, this is your designated area. It is our obligation to do everything we can to come up with solutions to not just find a place for them to sleep, but find a place for them in our community. Thank you. Um, okay, <clears throat> let's start this one with uh, Mr. Strauss. Um, individuals who have not been convicted and are awaiting trial can be held in county jail because they cannot post bail. A recent court decision requires judges to consider a defendant's ability to pay and offer a non-monetary alternative if it is found that the defendant cannot post bail. News reports suggest that more defendants are being released pre-trial as a result. Do you agree with the court's decision? Why or why not? I do agree with the court's decision. Why is someone uh, less dangerous because he has money to bail out? Let's, for example, let's take a case, maybe a, a spousal abuse case, and the guy's able to post bail. It's the same threat as someone who doesn't have enough money and gets put on the street. There are alternatives to bail. You could put someone on an ankle monitor. You could have them call and check in with the probation office every week. You could have them attend their AA and NA meetings, attend anger management meetings if that's their issues. So I do agree with the court's decision. Unfortunately, in practice, I haven't seen it too much because my clients are being denied OR releases and they're still putting bails on them. And I have one sitting in the Martinez jail who's mentally ill waiting for his pretrial conference on Friday because the judge ordered a $10,000 bail for someone who's mentally ill uh, when I advocated for his release and him being placed on an ankle monitor. So I think it's very important that we don't differentiate the danger to community by someone's financial worth. But what is the real risk to the community? We have to make sure that the person's issues are resolved. Thank you. Mr. Graves. I agree with examining the bail system and with reforms that make sense. However, under Marcy's law, the Victim's Bill of Rights, any bail reform should have a primary consideration the safety of the public and the safety of the victims. Now, when you say, do I agree with the Humphreys decision, portions of it are already the law. Considering the ability to pay should have been done by judges for years, and it has been for years. We have the current bail schedule, and I would agree that $100 to some people is the functional equivalent of a million dollars to others, and I understand that. But we need to have that independent judge making the decision. The problem with the Humphreys decision uh, and the way it actually came out in reality for many victims of crimes is that they were required at arraignment to show clear and convincing evidence that a defendant was a threat to public safety. And what that led to in our county were victims of stalking and domestic violence being forced to go into court, get on the stand, and testify and be subject to cross-examination. One of them was on the stand for four hours when she had been stalked for over a year and threatened with her life. That I don't agree with at all. That is a step backwards in getting victims to come forward. Meaningful bail reform means making a decision based on all the factors, but always remembering our obligation to victims of crime. And Ms. Becton. So yes, I agree with the Humphrey decision, and I also agree with the necessity for bail reform. The current system that we have is unsafe, and it is unfair. It is unsafe because it does not protect our community it does not protect victims of crime. We can simply have a person who is dangerous, too dangerous to be in our community, but because that person has money, they can post bail and be back out in our streets. So that's why it's unsafe. It's unfair because 70% of the people who are sitting in our jail are awaiting trial. It's costing approximately $120 a day, according to the most recent information that I received. And it is unfair when many of those people who are awaiting trial are there not because they're dangerous in our community, but because they simply cannot afford to pay. 
And so I firmly stand in support of bail reform. The Humphrey decision goes, takes the first step while we're waiting on the legislature to give us clear guidelines. And yes, we do have different treatment by different judges in our county, but it has taken the important step of requiring the court to consider dangerousness first to our community and to our victims. Okay, the next question, let's see. We'll start with Mr. Graves. Um, this is from the audience. If a police officer is killed or murdered in the, in the line of duty, will you pursue the death penalty? If not, why not? Well, the death penalty is the law, and it would be reserved for those cases that are the most heinous crimes available. The decision will be made based on an evaluation of the facts, uh, factors relating to the defendant regarding age and regarding uh, nature of the crime. But also you got to talk to the victims, the victim's family. Uh, since about 2010, we've had a death penalty review committee, and I've sat on that since about 2012, where you evaluate and you discuss the case. This is one of the most important decisions the district attorney is ever going to have to make. And I've been there and done it. I've prosecuted a death penalty case. I've seen the impact on the victim's family. I've seen the impact on a defendant's family. I've seen the impact on 12 members of our community that I've looked at and asked them to basically return a verdict of death. This is something that you need an experienced prosecutor to make. It should not be done lightly. It should be done with all the information. Defense attorneys should be allowed to submit evidence and mitigation. But if our officer is killed in the line of duty, and we just had a memorial today for Larry Lassiter, who I remember still like it was yesterday, the day he got killed, you have to strongly consider the death penalty. It is the law, and I would pursue the death penalty if all those factors supported it. Ms. Becton. Thank you. Yes, to answer your question, whenever there is a case that is in our system where the crime is heinous, where the crime is serious, the death penalty is the law in California. I will convene our committee that will consider all of the evidence, our committee that will also listen to the defense mitigating evidence, and a committee that will take into account the concerns and the voice of the victim's family. In addition to that, after careful deliberation, the final decision will rest with me. I've had to make that decision before, and I'm prepared to make it again. It is a very, very serious decision to make, it is, and it is done uh, not lightly, but taking into account all of the information and all of the factors that I've just mentioned. And Mr. Strauss. When an officer is killed, it not only affects that officer's family in the community, but it's a nationwide network of police officers in our country that it offends. Now, I differ on the application of the death penalty. I don't think the death penalty should be uh, for one type of uh, murder. I think that the death penalty should be reserved for serial murders and multiple victims. For example, everyone's familiar with the Oklahoma City bomber, Timothy McVeigh, who went in there in a, pre in a preschool and blew up the building killing multiple, multiple people. Those are the types of cases where we should exercise our discretion for death penalty. I feel sorry for the officer. It's part of the risk they take as being an officer on the street. I've trained police officers when I, when I was in Hawaii. I've always told them to approach every traffic stop with caution. You never know when someone's gonna open that glove box and pull a gun on them. So unfortunately, I don't think in that circumstances, I would recommend the death penalty. Um, okay, and let's see, I'm, uh, Mr. Graves, did I did I do go through that all? Okay. I just start again, but I'll go again. No, That's no, right. I was <laughs> I was looking at questions next. Okay, I have a follow-up question then, which is the other side of the coin. Officer-involved shootings are a regular occurrence around the nation. In Contra Costa County, sworn peace officers employed by the district attorney investigates these shootings. What is your position about having a civilian-led independent agency also conduct investigations, like in San Jose, Oakland, and the BART Police Department? And this is to me? Yeah. All right. 
The issue of officer-involved shootings is, uh, I don't think it's as endemic as we think. We just hear about them, but they're unfortunate whenever they happen. We do need to find a better way to build trust between all of our diverse communities and law enforcement. We need to listen and we need to talk about these issues and engage in a mutual dialogue. Our investigations in Contra Costa County with our protocol system is actually the gold standard in the state in terms of transparency and openness of the investigation as well as fairness. And when it comes to officer-involved shootings, we can always try to do better with our protocol. Absolutely. I'm always looking for ways to get better. Other counties look to us as the standard by which to investigate these. We always need to be open and transparent as much as possible. Now, I do not support a civilian-led commission looking into it, but I do support having body cameras on all police officers and finding ways for agencies that can't afford them to get them. I also support de-escalation training, um, but it, when it comes to officer-involved shootings in our current protocol, I would examine it and I will listen to arguments about why a civilian-led uh, investigation would be better, and I'm open to it, but I am very confident in what we have in place in our county. And I think one of the issues really is, is having a district attorney who is willing to meet with the families and talk about these issues and explain why decisions are being made. Ms. Becton. Um, this, the issue of officer-involved shooting is clearly a pivotal moment, not only in Contra Costa County, but for our entire nation. And I approach this issue not only as the district attorney, but I approach it as well as a leader in the criminal justice system and as a mother who's raised two black sons in this country. And in that role, I've had to talk to my sons about the times, the many times when they're stopped by law enforcement about how to keep themselves safe so that they can return home. So this is an opportunity for our country to come together and to have a serious discussion. We have to respect every position because just as we have too many black and brown lives that have been lost around the country, we also we have to respect the fact that we know that we have men and women who put their lives on the line every day to keep our communities safe. And so all of our voices need to be brought to the table. We need to make sure that those who do wrong in our communities are held accountable. Yes, de-escalation training is good, yes, Anti-bias training is good, and we thank Kamala Harris for making that available to all of law enforcement in, uh, con in California. But most importantly, I think this is the moment, this is our pivotal time to address this issue, the community coming together with law enforcement and having that conversation. And Mr. Strauss. I think we need to have a citizen committee to investigate officer-involved shootings. Everyone remembers the Rodney King trial in Los Angeles, where I came from, and there was video for that beating that that man took. Can you imagine if there was no videotape and it was being investigated by the district attorney's office? Now, you have to understand that the district attorney's office does work with law enforcement. They rely on law enforcement for the re police reports. They rely on law enforcement to investigate the case further. So we do need that intermediary. It's almost equivalent of the fox guarding the hen house. Um, it's absolutely necessary that we have that outside agency, outside person, investigate all officer-involved shootings and any type of alleged corruption in the district attorney's office. OK, the next question. Uh, let's start with you again, Mr. Strauss. Uh, what will you do to support professional fiduciaries in protecting elders against financial elder abuse? That's an audience question. Well, I was in court and I saw some uh, daughter, so their mother was older, and uh, the uh, caretaker ripped them off and was abusing her mother, and my heart went out to them. Um, I think that we have to educate our community, especially when you have caregivers coming into the homes. There has to be background checks. My, father has Alzheimer's now and my mother, so we're going through this personally as well, trying to find someone to take care of, of mom and dad. Um, I think that these cases are a priority case. They should be prosecuted. Um, 
they shouldn't be slapped on the wrist for these type of cases. But I do think that we need to educate the community. Go into senior assisted living homes. Go into church meetings. Uh, speak at the, the meetings and tell them, hey, you need to know who you're hiring. Because the one thing that lady told me in court was she never ran a background check on this person who was stealing as a cashier at one of her jobs. So I think we need to get the message out to the caretakers, to the family members, to make sure that they know that they could do background checks and make sure their relative and loved one is, is being given good care. Thank you. Mr. Graves? When I took over as the head of the Family Violence Unit, we only had one prosecutor assigned to, mental, uh, to elder abuse. And I fought to get a second prosecutor assigned for this very reason. These issues are very real. And we need to have people who are available to get out in the community to educate law enforcement on how to investigate the crimes and also go talk to elder communities and people impacted by this so they can come up with proactive solutions with the community that means something. Because this is a type of crime that goes underreported. It goes under prosecuted because too often people don't understand how to prosecute something when you're dealing with somebody with dementia or when maybe it's their son or it's their daughter who's taking financial advantage of them and they don't want to cooperate. By educating law enforcement, by getting out in the community, this is something that needs to stop. And we are taking a very, very proactive approach in my unit in both of those areas right now. And this is the type of dialogue and the type of meeting on whether or not we should have fiduciaries that I would like the people that I supervise to be having everywhere in the community and looking for solutions because that is how things get done. That is how we protect the community and that's how we can protect our elders who are some of our most vulnerable in our community. And Ms. Becton. I agree. The elders are some of the most vulnerable in our community. I've actually had the personal experience. I have a cousin who's 101 years old and her caretaker actually abused her physically and financially. It's a very difficult type of case to prosecute because of the fact that you ha often have family members as caretakers. And so the elder very often does not want to have to prosecute someone that is their niece or their cousin or their aunt. And then you have the problem of age, which also comes into play and dementia. <coughs> which makes it very difficult to prosecute as well. It's one of the reasons why I've led an effort. It's called Get Your House in Order. And I am very proud to have partnered um, with the legal community and with the faith community to take these events around our country, our, excuse me, our county, to be able to go into communities, to churches, and into centers. There's no cost to find out how do we protect our elders. How do we have the paperwork in place so that they have the legal documentation that will protect them and to protect their rights? I will continue to lead that effort and take it around to any community group that would like to have it, as well as making sure that the prosecutors in our office have the proper training in order to <coughs> prosecute these difficult cases. Good. We'll start with you again, Ms. Becton. In a 2014 ballot initiative, Voters lowered the penalties of many drug and theft crimes from felonies to misdemeanors. Do you support this decision? What is your position on efforts to reverse this decision? Thank you. So the reform measures that you've talked about have uh, taken a certain class of lower level uh, felonies and um, legislated that they would become misdemeanors. And this has all been part of the reform efforts in California. There's currently legislation that is pending that would uh, reverse those efforts. And that legislation is partly based upon uh, an argument that these uh, reform efforts have caused an uptick in crime. So first of all, I wanted to point out that there's been a downward trim in the violent crime in our communities for several years. There has been a slight uptick in property crimes across California. But we have to be careful before we dismantle some of the reforms that have been put in place. There's a recent UC Irvine study 
which indicates that this small uptick in the property crime is not related to the form reform efforts at all, and that we don't have the data to support that argument. And so I think we need to take a very careful look at the arguments that are behind doing away with the criminal justice reforms that have been recently put in place and give those reforms a chance to work. Um, Mr. Strauss. By a show of hands, how many has been a victim of an auto theft or a house break-in? I mean, it is rampant since this proposition passed. And you may recall my opening statement that we need to get these cases prosecuted fast. We can't have the thief being cited by police officers who are doing a good job. They're, they're catching them, only to have them go to court in their 90-day citation, have the district attorney's office not following up with their complaints, and guess what? They're back cycled out in the community again. Right? Enough is enough. The inefficiency and ineffectiveness of the district attorney's office has to change. And I know I can make a change in difference. There are several areas I've already identified that I think we could cut back so we could put our resources and energy to actually stopping the increase of these crimes. It's very frustrating. One day in my community, the thief hit five or six houses. Um, enough is enough. I think that I agree that we don't need to send them to prison, but we need to get involved in the judicial system earlier and not just have what we call a catch, site, and release program, which the current district attorney's office is doing. Thank you. Mr. Graves. We're talking about Proposition 47, and I think with any proposition or any legislation, there are always ways to make it better. And one of the issues with Proposition 47, I disagree with Ms. Becton's analysis that there's a slight uptick in property crimes. All you have to do is read the Chronicle to see the major spike in auto burglaries and theft crimes in San Francisco. Prop 47 went too far. Uh, and the reason I say that is because you can commit 100 thefts as long as it's under $950. You can avail yourself of no treatment program, no anything, and you don't have to comply with anything, and it will always be a misdemeanor. And that in and of itself, if you can talk about doing it 100 times, 200 times, and always being a misdemeanor, something that maybe we need to think about fixing and have a discussion about. Now, the interesting thing, in Contra Costa County, we're actually on the edge of being able to be proactively working on our crime rate instead of working on uh, Proposition 47. Interesting study back in 2010 before Proposition 47 and AB 109. Did you realize that Contra Costa County was second from the bottom in the state of California in the percentage of people per 100,000 we were sending to state prison? This is before any reforms. And that study was, uh, again, in 2015, we were seventh from the bottom, only because some of the smaller counties that were sending people to prison for drug offenses fell below us because they couldn't anymore. And also what they said, I'll cite the other story, uh, study later. <laughs> he's, like seeing, to, he's seeing I, time's up. <laughs> I, I would like to rebut. You're going to use your second rebuttal. Thank okay. you. Most of these property crimes that are occurring are people with substance abuse issues and mental health issues and don't have job skills. It's not that they're out there just trying to rip off, because I've interviewed them. I've interviewed five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people on, on these issues. And what we need to do as a community is to not you know, do that cite and release thing that their office is doing, but get them involved in the judicial system and start ordering terms for their OR release, like attending NAA or NA meetings, like actually having them try to get uh, education, give them incentives to do something, not just the 900 cases that Mr. Davis is talking about. Well, part of the problem is their office by not getting the people to court early enough to help. Thank you. Okay, um, then I'm gonna follow up with a question that kind of relates to this. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Becton, many crimes stem from mental health issues. How will the district attorney's office treat cases of suspects who so show signs of mental illness or PTSD compared to other cases? Okay. This is what I was referring to um, earlier in terms of the work that I'm doing already to convene the task force around our county that will bring together not only law enforcement but also mental health, homeless uh, advocates as well as those who work on addiction. Um, 
the problem that we have with homeless, home with the mental health problem, uh, creates three different issues that have to be addressed if we're going to solve the problem. The first is, of course, the mental illness. The second is the homelessness. And the third is the drug addiction. And unless we're working on some, a system that attacks all of those problems, we'll keep recycling people through our system. We're working to look at diversion models from around the country. Los Angeles County has an excellent model that's led by the district attorney's office. We visited that program as well as the one in Dade County. And we'll be bringing those models to Contra Costa County. They're models that um, take a look at all aspects of this problem, including the three that I've just identified. And it looks for ways to safely divert these cases, the ones that are low level, nonviolent cases, away from our criminal justice system and into treatment. We have too many in our county who are mentally ill who are sitting in jail when we could really be diverting them safely into the community with services once they are stabilized. So I am, will continue the work that I've already started uh, to make sure that we are safely diverting the mentally ill out of our criminal justice system. Mr. Strauss. As a deputy prosecutor in Hawaii, I was in charge of diverting mentally ill defendants. I had a telephone number I called to the community uh, health person there. I would be on the phone saying, I have Mr. Smith in court today just looking at his case, I remember one guy was stealing a flag off a flagpole in front of a fire station. So I knew something wasn't right. So I would call him up and say, hey, I have Mr. Smith in court. Can you pick him up? And what I would do as the deputy prosecutor, we call him in Hawaii's deputy district attorney here, is I would personally divert these cases. Now, I'm at odds and wondering why our, our district attorneys, our deputy district attorneys, are not calling up a mental health person and saying, I have Mr. Smith in this court. I recognize these facts. It looks like he has some serious problems and maybe you should go pick him up. I, again, I have my client, Mr. Del Prado, sitting in the Martinez jail with mental health issues because there is no mental health diversion for him and the judge denied him his OR release. So this is a problem that needs to be resolved. It needs to be a more proactive approach by district attorneys, educate him to, to mental health issues, being able to recognize fact, part, fact patterns so you could have that person from the community mental health organization come into court and take the client. And Mr. Grace. Well, I already talked about my vision for a mental health justice center. I've talked about the problem with diversion, but we do have diversion. We're just not getting enough defendants onto the diversion. And also we have a mental health court. It's run by the Honorable Judge Brady right now. And a lot of people get diverted there or they go to mental health court and we're trying to make a difference. But let's have a reality check. There's not that many health service individuals out there for mental health to serve the defendants. This is a community problem that we all need to address together. I can tell you from experience though, one way a DA makes a big difference, instead of compartmentalizing everybody and putting them in a box, address the specific problem they have and get creative with a solution for it. I just did it the other day on an elder abuse case. It was a mother and her daughter, elderly victim, and the daughter suffered from fetal alcohol syndrome. Now the punishment and the requirement for elder abuse was gonna be treating her for something that had nothing to do with fetal alcohol syndrome. I stepped in as a supervisor and said, that's not doing anybody any good. So we structured a very structured uh, sentence for her where she would actually get treatment specific to fetal alcohol syndrome. She would report, we get a report back from the doctor, the specific therapist that had been working with her. That's what you need from a prosecutor. Somebody who's gonna take a creative solution, not put everybody in the box, and is willing to go out on a limb and say, this is what this particular defendant needs to become a productive member of our community, and this will help them get back, and that's what we should be doing. Okay, next question. Um, this is an audience question. What is or should be the DA, DA's policy regarding the testing of rape kits and preventing a testing backlog? And that will go first to Mr. Strauss. Well, I can tell you this. In my position of representing inmates at the prisons, I, uh, in my position of representing inmates in prisons, I come across a lot of rape cases. And this is a high priority. We need to get these cases processed. We need to get these kits tested, and we need to get these people put into the court system. Um, 
there is some serious issues when you deal with a person who's out there raping the community. There's uh, sexual deviancy, there's mental health, it's like just a whole bunch of issues that that person usually has. And if we are delaying the processing of these rape kits, and this person is still out there in the community wreaking havoc upon innocent people and civilians, then shame on the district attorney's office. Those cases should be high priority cases. They should be worked on 24 hours a day till that kid is processed, until that complaint can be filed, and that perpetrator be brought to justice. Um, Mr. Graves. Well, I am happy to announce to whoever asked that question, we do not have a backlog in Contra Costa County. Uh, in fact, we are all up to speed. We, uh, during the course of my time when I was in the sexual assault unit, we got what's called the Danny Grant. It was from the DA of New York. We shipped all the untested uh, kits, and they're over in Utah, and they're almost all done and being completed. We don't have a backlog now. In fact, we have a 20-day turnaround at our crime lab. And as, sitting, as someone who sits on the sexual uh, assault response team, I go to the multidisciplinary team meetings, and under the law, police agencies need to get every rape kit now to the crime lab within 20 days, and we are getting a turnaround. So I am pleased to announce that in Contra Costa County, we are way ahead of the curve because of our grant and getting all of our backlog done, and now it's just maintaining the leadership of our office and making sure that all the law enforcement agencies are getting those kits to the crime lab, and we are getting quick turnarounds. So I hope that makes whoever asked the question feel a little bit better about our county. Ms. Becton. Thank you. So that is correct. Unlike many other counties who've had the issue of backlogs, our district attorney's office has uh, in the past received a grant. We do have our rape test all up to date. The few that have not yet been tested are those where the perpetrator is known. Because as you're aware, many of these crimes um, that occur happen um, based upon a person that the victim is already familiar with. It could be a family member, et cetera. So there's just a few of those that remain untested and we're working on those as well. We will continue to keep the issue in the forefront as we continue to partner with law enforcement on this issue to make sure that all of our law enforcement agencies are in compliance and that they are getting those rape kits to our crime lab for testing in the appropriate amount of time. Okay, this question will start with Mr. Graves. Um, the law requires that during plea negotiations on immigration matters, the district attorney should consider immigration consequences such as the effect of detention or de deportation on families or the dangers faced in the county of or country of origin. How would your district attorney's office implement this? We would follow the law and we do what we've been doing in my unit and throughout the office since the law passed, is making sure that we're complying with our obligation to consider immigration consequences when negotiating a case. It's obviously very difficult when families get broken up and when there are issues with immigration, and so we do take it very, very seriously. Not every case is going to result in an immigration safe deal. Uh, I deal a lot with sexual assault cases and making all the offers, and if there's a child molest victim or a rape victim, it's very hard to tell one of them that we're gonna call this false imprisonment and make it something else just to make an immigration safe deal. But we do factor it into consideration. The difficult cases, obviously, are murder cases, sexual assault cases, and domestic violence cases. But we'll continue to work with the public defender's office, continue to work under our ethical obligations, and try to find solutions and consider plea negotiations uh, and consider immigration consequences in terms of every plea. It's the law, and we need to be ethically doing it, and everybody in the office needs to be following that procedure and making appropriate determinations. And like I always say, my motto is, as prosecutors, we should be motivated to do the right thing. And if you take every case and you look at it that way, you will get to the right result. Ms. Becton. The questioner is correct that the law does require prosecutors <clears throat> to consider the immigration consequences when negotiating a plea. And so there are several uh, ways that we have to approach this problem. The first is to make sure that the policy in our office is uh, up to date and in compliance with the law. We're reviewing our current policy and making sure that it complies with all of the legal requirements that are set forward in our code sections. The second um, is to make sure that we have the appropriate training in our office and we are going forward with setting those trainings up. 
so that we can uh, make sure that all of our attorneys are aware of all of our legal requirements and that we can give specific examples and ways in which the law might to ap apply to different kinds of cases. So twofold, making sure that our policies are accurate and up to date, and two, making sure that we have adequate training for all of our attorneys to take into account the immigration consequences and impact. And Mr. Strauss. You know, I'm kind of shocked that anyone would take into immigration consequences when there's a murder. I've been in state prison dealing with immigrants who have their ice holds for committing these murders. I will not take into a person's immigration status on any violent crime, rape, murder, robbery that occurs in this community because that person doesn't deserve it. Um, I think in other situations when maybe there's a, a, a domestic dispute between a husband and wife and one's not uh, a citizen or doesn't have permanent papers, yes, I think that maybe we could take into the uh, immigration consequences in a situation like that. But any type of violent felony, I don't care what the law requires. I would not take into that person's immigration consequences. You can rest assured. Okay, the next question. Um is an audience question, and we'll start with uh, Ms. Becton. Can you discuss your experience in running and leading an organization as large, both in terms of employers and budget, as the Contra Costa DA's office, and how you would allocate resources? Thank you. Well, having served as a judge uh, in this county for 22 years, I had the um, good fortune to be elected as the presiding judge which means that I was responsible for all of the courts in Contra Costa County, including a budget of roughly $54 million. Uh, in addition to that, those, so those are the leadership skills that I bring with me from the court. I am the immediate past president of the National Association of Women Judges, another organization that I led that's nationwide where we have to allocate resources and deal with the budget. Prior to that, I've had uh, management training ever since I uh, first graduated from college, and I've held several management training positions, several management positions where I've led a unit or an office and had to allocate resources. One of the biggest challenges that came for me was actually when I led the court through one of the most difficult budget times in, our, in my uh, history with the court. Uh, we had suffered significant budget cuts from the state, and we really had to figure out how we could continue to do business, how we could continue to serve the public, but at the same time cut back on all of our resources. We, we had to close courthouses, and it was a difficult decision to make, but we did it by collaborating not only with our staff and the other judges, but with our community so that we could make sure that we were doing it in a way that was responsive to all of the concerns. Mr. Strauss? Well, I think everyone in this audience has to deal with their own budget in life and what expenses they need to make and what payments and what they need to buy in order for themselves to live properly. And I don't care if it's one person, two people, 20 people, 200 people. That process of making difficult decisions is something the ordinary citizens do every day. What I would do is I would look at every position in that office and see if they're being efficient, are they being effective, are they making their cases uh, promptly, filing the cases, are the cases being resolved? And I would hire, if necessary, an outside consultant to handle the budgeting uh, matter. You know, one thing about my job in going to church is I learned it's okay to ask for help if you don't know all the answers. And yes, I haven't been the head of the DA's office, and you know, I've been in a, DA, in a prosecuting attorney's office, so I, I'm kind of familiar with what the budgets are for and the grant funded positions and what areas and what departments get uh, funded. What I've heard though is that there is no grant writer in the district attorney's office who's going after extra funding to help put on an extra staff attorney. And that's what I would investigate. Um, and Mr. Graves. In terms of experience, leading the office. I've been there for 22 years. Uh, I've been a career prosecutor. I served as a district attorney association president. Uh, and we, had, we actually did our first budget uh, for the union when I was the president because we obviously needed a budget. And we were able to negotiate a contract. 
But what this really comes down to as a leader and a supervisor is I was humbled to have the support from the DAs in my office, the prosecutors to see me day in and day out. That speaks volumes to what they think of my abilities, and my ability to lead the office, and their support of my proactive vision of a victim-centered office that restructures and reshapes our resources. When we talk about budget in the district attorney's office, what we're really talking about is priorities. We can find budget, we can shift resources for priorities, and it pains me still to this day that in 2018, we do not have a human trafficking division in our office. And that would be a priority of mine. And I don't need to have run a major corporation to be able to tell you I can make that happen by making the necessary changes in this office and actually prioritizing those crimes which impact our community the most. Okay, this next question, uh, we'll, we'll start with Mr. Strauss. We're facing a crisis in the abuse of opioid drugs, often resulting in criminal prosecution of opioid users. What are some approaches you would like to see instituted to address this issue? Well, for my theme tonight, I think everyone understands that I'm a big believer in diversion and getting drug users out of the court system and getting the help they need. So the first step is when anyone comes into the criminal justice system is I would try to get them out on a diversion program, and I would actually, as the DA's office, I would, I would sponsor them. Because if we get people treated with their issues, they won't be criminals. It helps eliminate uh, criminal tendencies. Um, I think that with the uh, opiate crisis, that we need to understand a little bit more that uh, we, need, we need to go in and educate the communities. Again, starting in the elementary schools, and continuing on about drug use, about the negative effects of drugs. The program I want to have, my, have people who have been paroled is to bring them into the schools and talk about their experience about using drugs and what it led to. Uh, Mr. Graves. I agree that we need to educate the youth about this, and I know Laura Delhunt from our office does get out in the community and talk about this, but we also need to address what the real cause of the problem is overprescribing drugs, getting drugs uh, out in the community that aren't necessary. And I've seen it happen. I'm sure many of you have seen it happen. You go in for a small procedure and you can get um, a prescription for oxycodone two months before you ever even need it, or you may never need it. And you get that prescription filled and it sits in your medicine cabinet and it's there for your children to take. And that is sort of how many people I've seen throughout my career have gotten started on a lot of these opioids. Um, I even had a student who was a straight-A student at St. Mary's College that was out burglarizing houses to support her problem because her parents' cabinet was clean and she needed to go out and find more drugs. So we need to actually use our task force and all of our resources to not only educate and to help rehabilitate those who have the problem, but also go after the root of the problem and make sure that doctors out there are not overprescribing and not filling out prescriptions just based on a phone call for people who don't need it, because you can actually run these searches and see the number of times certain doctors are getting these out in the community just because somebody says, I have a little bit of back pain, and we need to be proactive and actually hold people accountable for getting these opioids out onto the, into the community. Ms. Becton. Well, first of all, um, in, I think it was September of last year, I convened a caucus in Washington, D.C. on this very issue. We wanted to bring together Congress, our legislators, the courts, and also providers, as well as those who've actually had uh, the experience of being addicted to opiates, so that we could have a robust conversation, not only about the problems that have led people, including our grandparents and uh, aunts and uncles who have become addicted uh, to this uh, new drug. One of the things we've learned from the war on drugs is that that kind of, a, of an approach to criminalization was not one that worked. The opiate crisis in our country is one that is a health crisis and we need to treat it as such. So for those cases that are coming into our criminal justice system, we need to make sure that we have the diversion programs in place so that people with uh, drug addiction problems, especially from the opiates, can be safely diverted away from our criminal justice system and into the treatment that they need. 
Another solution has been not just working with the individual, but working with something that's trending in on the East Coast and I'd like to bring here, and it's called a family court because these problems are affecting families. The parents, the grandparents, and the children are all affected. And so we need to make sure that we have courts and solutions that are dealing and treating the entire family. We are getting on to the witching hour, so this is going to be the last question before you give your um, final closing statements. And I'll start with um, Mr. Graves. Sexual harassment has been in the forefront lately. How would you assess the rights of victims versus the rights of the accused? Well, anybody who has followed me or watched me as head of the sexual assault unit, I take this very seriously, sexual assault awareness and intervention and getting out in the schools and talking to the students about issues of consent and really create, treating each other with dignity and respect. That's really what it's all about and creating that dialogue. And so when it comes to sexual harassment, if you're talking about in the office, will not be tolerated under my administration, absolutely not. If you're talking out in the community, we can make a difference by continuing to get out and educate students. And we've had a great response at the high schools we get to where we talk about treating each other with respect, dignity, and actually advising of issues like uh, consent and intoxication and having ways that people can be um, intervene as bystanders to actually make the community a better place. Instead of standing there and not doing something, being the person that will speak up and take action and protect others is very important to me. And it's a message we've been trying to spread, and it's a message that includes things like sexual harassment and um, any kind of sexual violence or assault. And so. I've always been on the side of the victims. I always support the victims, and it will not be tolerated in my administration, and I don't believe it should be tolerated in the community. Um, Ms. Beckton? I think what the Me Too movement around the country has shown us is that for too long, victims of sexual assault have been afraid to come forward. They've been afraid to report crimes. And so we want to make sure that we're getting the message out into our communities that when, they, when a person is a victim of sexual assault, that they will have a voice, that they will be heard, and that those who are committing those crimes will be held accountable. I was very proud to stand uh, along with others uh, this morning before the Board of Supervisors as they adopted an, a resolution uh, declaring April uh, Sexual Awareness Month. This is just one effort that's been underway to make sure that our community is aware of this issue that we are bringing educational opportunities to our schools and to other uh, places in our community to make sure that everyone knows that if you are a victim of crime that includes a sexual assault, that your voice will be heard. We have slogans all over the county saying it's no longer the old boys club or, you know, it happened to me too. So we're making sure that we're out there. We are letting people know that um, victims of crime, of sexual assault, uh, will have a, a voice in our office, and that those who are committing those crimes will be held accountable. And Mr. Strauss. As a deputy prosecutor, I was trained in sexual assault by having the SART St. Nurses come in and educate our office to uh, the examinations. I think this is an important issue. Again, we need to make sure that these cases are handled expeditiously. We have to prioritize these cases not go through the rigmarole I said earlier about being cited. We have to make sure that when this occurs that the victim is protected. As district attorney, I would seek protective orders against all perpetrators of sexual harassment or sexual assault. That would come under the first uh, court hearing if I, uh, when the, the defendant comes in for an arraignment. Uh, I think that we need to educate people. Uh, I think that the media has been good in exposing what's been going on for a long, long time. Uh, I think people are finally feeling that they have a voice to speak up, but we really need to start educating the schools and all the way through uh, junior college, college level, that this is not gonna be tolerated. Um, there should be, I haven't heard our, our DAs talk about it, but we had uh, sexual harassment training when I was a prosecutor in our office. We came in and we met, uh, and I still received training uh, for sexual harassment in the uh, other areas of law. Thank you. Okay. That's the last of our questions before we do the closing statement. 
Uh, I got through a lot of years, and a lot of years were also answered, even though they were kind of similar. But if I didn't get through yours, I'm hoping that the candidates might stay after, and you could come up and personally ask them a question. But I think we covered a lot of ground tonight. Um, and this is being, as I said earlier, um, filmed by the city of Walnut Creek through CCTA. And so there will be a schedule out at some point in, shortly in the future when you can find out uh, to view this, or you can tell your friends and neighbors to view it, because they didn't have the privilege of being here tonight as you did. Um, but also, the Contra Costa County Bar Association will have a page, will have this off on their homepage by the end of this week. So you can look for it there also. So we do want everybody to be able to have the opportunity to hear these candidates, who I think were all very professional and covered a lot of ground. And so we're very pleased with that. And we're going to go now to their closing statements and go in the reverse order, which means that Diana Becton will be our first closer. Thank you. I'm very proud to serve as your district attorney. Um, and I'm also proud that we made history in Contra Costa County, history that allowed me to be the first woman and the first person of color to serve in this position in the 167 year history of our office. I want to also share with you that I have a wide, wide range of support, not only from our community, but also from the California Nurses Association, the Sierra Club, many of our uh, congressmen, the building trades, labor, uh, the plumbers and the steam fitters, Indivisible, Congressman Swalwell, Congressman DeSalnier, Congressman Thompson, Senator Dodd, Senator Skinny, Skinner, Lonnie Hancock, Ron Davis, the former director to the U.S. Department of Justice, and also community groups around the county. I will continue the work that I've started, better outcomes for our youth, the mentally ill, and for low-level crimes. I hope I've earned your vote. Okay, and Mr. Paul Graves. Thank you. One thing I've learned working in the DA's office for 22 years um, is our role is mainly to keep the public safe and to serve victims of crime. And I've done about six to seven forums since last year, and we haven't talked much about standing up for victims of crime. The last question was one of the first I've heard. My compassion and support of victims has defined my career for 22 years. As a sexual assault prosecutor and as a supervisor, People often ask me, how can you deal day in and day out with hearing these stories and what happens? And I've come to tell them now that I have the rare privilege of walking with heroes every day. Because the courage it takes for a young child, a teenager, or an adult to come forward and find their voice and actually make a report of physical or sexual abuse and then go through the court system and go through the process is amazing. They are true heroes in every sense of the word and they cannot be forgotten. And I can guarantee you, under my administration, they will not be forgotten because I am a prosecutor. And finally, Lawrence Strauss. One of my jobs in criminal law is representing inmates in the prisons for life or parole hearings. And I come across a lot of young attorneys and they ask me, what makes a good life or parole attorney? And I tell them this, hand on the wheel, car and cruise control, because you're driving three to four hours around the state of prisons. I was in Corcoran and I had a Contra Costa County case and Mr. Gresset, who's the deputy district attorney, appeared. And I'm wondering why is he wasting our money when the district attorney's office could do these life or parole hearings by either video conference or telephone? I don't have that luxury. So Mr. Gresset, who's traveling three and a half hours each way to Corcoran, is getting paid. His hotel is getting paid. His meals are getting paid. And these hearings don't always start on time, so he's there waiting an hour, hour and a half, still on the taxpayer's dollars. As a small business owner, I'm going to change that. I'm going to make sure that this office is run efficiently and effectively. And I look forward to your vote. So these are your three candidates. And I hope you will tell your friends and neighbors about this, um, this taping. And I want to thank the uh, Costa, Contra Costa County Bar Association and uh, Walnut Creek and CCTA, CCTV, and all of you for actually coming tonight. The vote, the, your vote is on June 5th, so that's coming up soon. And let's conclude by giving our candidates a big round of applause.